Welcome to the show. We have a great show today. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than the usual. I will be doing a knife build, which is pretty common, uh, but this time I'm doing it as a part of a collaboration with another YouTuber named Pyrotech1999. Now, that's not actually his name, uh, but that's his YouTube channel, Pyrotech1999. So I will have a link in the description below. Uh, if you know his channel, then you know he does really good stuff. If you don't, absolutely go and check him out. Uh, at the end of this video, I will also put a link to his channel so you can find it that way. If you're here from Pyrotech's channel, uh, thank you. Welcome to the show. And uh, I hope you enjoy what you see. If you do, look around my channel, you know, check out a few other videos, subscribe if you haven't. I would love to have you as a part of the community here. So uh, the idea behind this collaboration is he designed a knife for me to make and I designed one for him. Now, uh, this was his idea. I thought it was a great idea. He contacted me probably two months ago now. I think he had just crossed over a thousand subs and I was approaching a thousand. Uh, but then of course, you know, one thing leads to another. It's holiday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever was coming up. Uh, so we really didn't get around to it until right now. So again, when you come to the end of this video, by all means, go over and check out his. I designed a knife for him to make and uh, I will show you the knife that he designed for me to make and then we'll get to it. So I really didn't know what to expect uh, until I got this design in the mail. And when I saw it, I was actually pretty excited because I haven't ever done a hidden tang knife before. And I knew that this was gonna be a great opportunity to learn some new skills while also creating something that I hoped in the end would be a beautiful knife. To begin with, I had a piece of 01 tool steel. This is an oil hardening steel. It's one that I've used before. And I figured it would be a great steel for this project. So I just used some marker to sketch out the outline on the piece and then I got to work with a cutting disc on the angle grinder. I'm hoping to invest in a bandsaw pretty soon. I think that'll make the process uh, maybe not so much easier, but it'll make it easier to be precise. Now I knew it would be important to have a really good right angle uh, right down here where the blade will meet the hilt of the knife. So I did take a little time to clean that up with metal files. Of course it takes a little extra time but it's definitely worth it because of that nice tight fit that you'll get later. Now for putting in the bevel, uh, you'll see me doing all of this freehand. I do have a bevel jig that I made in another one of my videos but I'm really trying to work on my freehand bevel grinding skills. So whenever I get the chance to practice, I usually take that opportunity. So once I had the bevel down to about a sixteenth of an inch, that's about as narrow as I want to get it before I do the quench. So, uh, so at that point I brought it back to the vise and started work on the gut hook. This also is the first gut hook that I've ever done on a knife. So there's a certain amount of just kind of guesswork that went into this for me. You'll see me here quite often kind of stopping to look at it and make sure that things are going the way I want them to. Uh, you know, I, I was really determined to just do a little at a time because really didn't want to get too far into that blade and wind up having to scrap it once I've already made it this far. Once I had it notched with the angle grinder, I went over and did the rest by hand with, uh, with metal files. It's nice to slow down and work by hand, especially when you're trying something new. You can stop and check your work along the way, and you don't kind of have that fear that something's gonna get away from you and you're gonna screw something up catastrophically. And the gut hook, I kind of went with the same idea as the, as the bevel. I didn't want to completely sharpen it because when this goes into the quench, there could be cracking or warping if the metal gets too thin. So once I had it down to about a sixteenth of an inch, I fired up the forge. For the quench, I'm using oil, which is what's recommended with O1 tool steel. You couldn't really see it there, but I was, uh, I was testing the metal with a magnet to make sure it was hot enough. Uh, many of you will be familiar with that, but for those who aren't, when you have steel up to a good quenching temperature, it will no longer be magnetic. So if you don't have like equipment to tell you what the temperature is of the steel, you can use a magnet and that actually gives you a really good indicator of when you've reached the right temperature to do the quench. So after the quench, the steel has hardened, but it's also quite brittle. So to introduce some toughness back into the blade, I will temper for about one hour. This is a relatively small piece of steel, so I figure one hour at 400 should be good. 
Lately, I've kind of gotten into the forge blackened look, so to do that, I'm heating the blade with a torch and using beeswax. I think the ideal temperature for this is probably, I don't know, 300 degrees or something like that. The most important thing really is that you don't want to get it above that tempering temperature because you can actually wind up with a softer steel than what you had when it, when it came out of the tempering oven. Now in this case, I probably did push it up into that range, probably got up to 400, 450. Uh, but I tried to aim most of the flame uh, away from that actual edge itself. I think there are advantages to having the spine of the knife being a little bit softer, a little bit tougher than the, than the very edge. For the hilt of the knife, I'm going to use a copper bullion coin. This is pretty much 100% pure copper, which means it's actually quite soft. And I wanted to give it kind of a hammered finish. If I was going to keep the whole coin, I might have just kept the design because it was actually kind of a cool design. But since I'll be cutting the whole thing down to the right size and shape to fit, uh, I decided I'd just go for a hammered finish. I didn't need to heat this up or anything. Copper is, you know, a softer metal and so you can hammer finish just by wailing away on it for a while. You can see, especially uh, the ball-peen hammer there will give it a nice finish. After hammering it, I trimmed it down. I didn't want to trim it too far, but I knew that to match the block of wood I was using, I could cut off two of the sides here, and, uh, and of course they'll be grinding and stuff later, but this will save some of that work later on. Using a brand new drill press here, uh, this is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, the only thing is I don't have a drill press vise or anything like that set up yet, so I had to uh, just kind of clamp things in place, you know, get things lined up the way I wanted them, clamp them in place, and then drill from there. And, you know, you have to make a couple little adjustments when you see that, you're, uh, that the bit is kind of biting in the wrong spot or something. Uh, of course, because I'm using eighth inch stock uh, on the knife, I didn't want to get this hole any larger than an eighth of an inch because this is where the tang of the knife will go through. So I had to be pretty precise with these holes. And uh, in the end, you'll see I wind up doing a lot of this work with some files. The filing process here is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you kind of size things up, you see where it's making contact, and then you do a little bit more work with the files, uh, test it again, a little more work with the files, test it again. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind, I guess, you know, it's, it's easy to file the metal away, but not so easy to put it back. So. For me, the, the key here was just to go a little at a time until I had the right fit. Now to do the final fit up there, you'll see me using, uh, I just used a block of wood to pound things into place. Again, copper is pretty soft, pretty forgiving, so if you're really close to a good fit, uh, it's kind of nice to leave it tight like that and just tap it in the rest of the way. The wood that I'm using here is actually, I believe it's ash, and uh, it came from my brother's property. Uh, we've got a fireplace here, but we don't really have trees, so he sent over some hardwood for us. So I took a piece of it that looked pretty decent and uh, cut it down and kind of shaped it. It's been sitting on the property here for well over a year, so I know it's, it's good and dried out, it's good and seasoned. But I figured it would be fun, you know, it kind of adds a little meaning to the knife, uh, knowing where the wood came from. Now, for drilling the hole for the tang, uh, again, this is a process that I wanted to do slowly. This is my first time using the drill press for this type of work. And just like working with the copper, it's a lot easier to remove wood than it is to put it back. So I figured the slower I went, the better. Of course, when we do the glue up, this, uh, this will be filled with an epoxy. So, you know, it's a little bit more forgiving that way. But I would still say the tighter the fit, the better because relying on the strength of the wood to support the tang of the knife, probably better than, uh, than putting all your hopes on that epoxy. So after testing the fit, I just went back and kind of by hand uh, finished out that hole. I didn't feel like it was necessary to have things clamped in place once I had those, those original holes drilled. Now the glue up with this is uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. In fact, this is one aspect of the hidden tang knife that is much easier than a knife that you're doing with scales. With scales, you usually have at least two or three holes drilled in both scales, plus the tang of the knife uh, for pins, and then you have all of these little you know, moving parts, little pieces that are laying around, and you have to glue everything up, and a lot of times you've got like a fast drying epoxy, and you know, you've got to get everything done in four or five minutes, or it's going to be too hard to work and everything. Doing this knife, when it came to the glue up, was just an absolute joy. At least this part of it, it, it can be trickier getting everything you know, set up and sized right and ready to go. 
Uh, but once it comes to the actual glue up itself, uh, you just can't beat the hidden tang knife. The clamp I was using, uh, it barely opened wide enough to actually get the knife in there. So uh, for a minute there, I was kind of scared that it wasn't going to fit. Uh, but it did in the end, uh, it fit really nicely. And I was able to clamp it really well here. I don't know that there's a whole lot to say about the rest of this process. Uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. The video speaks for itself. Um, it may seem like slow going, but this, to me, this part of the process, it's so important to take your time, do things right. You know, there may be people who are much more talented and experienced than I am who can, you know, whip through this, these finishing stages of the knife. But for me, you know, everything up to this point probably took me maybe a couple hours of work. Um, but from here on out, I bet I had four hours or five hours into, uh, into really finishing this thing. But of course, for the sake of this video, that will all be condensed down to about three minutes here. So I probably should have mentioned this sooner. Uh, there was one change that I decided to make to the design, and that is the grip of the knife. I actually really like the design that he came up with, but I've been wanting to try more the, the Scandinavian style knife handle for a while. So there will be just, probably I'd call it a subtle change here, but, there, but the, the shape, the contours, the geometry of the handle is a little bit different. And again, that's not a knock on his design. I think his handle looked great and it looked like a very ergonomic handle too. Uh, but, I, but I just wanted to try a little bit different style. Once I had the handle pretty much down to where I wanted it, I figured I could finish up the rest with sandpaper later. But it was time to put the finishing touches on the bevel and on the edge. And uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I was going for a Scandi grind on this knife. And I have attempted that a couple times in the past and just, I haven't had good luck with it. And for those who don't know, a Scandi grind is, uh, it's essentially just one continuous flat bevel all the way down to the very edge of the knife. Um, I didn't quite get a flat, a nice flat grind. Uh, there's just a little bit, and, and you'll see this um, probably more at the end, you'll see. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, it's almost a convex grind. And there's no real way around it. That's because of the lack of skill on my part. But that's one of the things that I'm working on. And one of the reasons I was glad to have this project to really, uh, you know, to stretch my skills. And uh, that's definitely an area that I need to keep working on, is that uh, the freehand grinding skills. But with that said, I still wound up with a very, very nice edge and uh, and very sharp edge, as you'll see here in a minute. Now, I won't say too much about the gut hook, partly because I don't feel like I was ever fully successful in making a truly functional gut hook. I was thinking when I started out that this would uh, best be done using a round file. But as soon as you start thinking about the geometry involved, uh, you, you realize that a round file might get you a very, very small sharp edge on the inside of that hook, but it's not really going to get you a, a functional cutting edge. So after working with the round file, I did use a tiny square file and I went in and tried to give myself a little bit longer of a, of a cutting edge. Then I went back in with another round file and tried to clean that up. And I, in the end, I got something I'm not necessarily totally satisfied with, but I think it would be functional in the field. It's just, I still feel like I could do better. Uh, so that might be something to, um, to work on on a future project. Now, in case you're wondering if I wound up with a good sharp edge on there, uh, yeah, she cuts. So obviously I went in and cleaned that up and threw a couple band-aids on there and came back out to finish the knife. So really the, the last step here before I do the final sort of cleanup is to put in a brass pin uh, that'll run side to side through the handle and through the tang of the knife. Now, fortunately, when I did the hardening of the blade, I made sure not to harden the tang. For anybody who's ever tried to drill a hole through hardened steel, you know that it is almost unbelievable how difficult it can be to drill through hardened steel, at least without specialized equipment. Uh, so I made sure not to harden that tang, and it was actually surprising to me how smoothly this went. Now, from the beginning, I was wondering whether I should use, uh, use copper pins, or if I should use brass, if I should use steel, and I decided brass was the way to go. I kind of like the idea of having three different metals with three different characteristics in the, in the finished form of the knife. Okay, truthfully, brass is what I had and I didn't feel like making a special trip just to buy copper, especially when I was this close to done with the knife. But I do think you'll agree when you see it all done that uh, the brass looks perfectly fine. 
Now, if you've ever worked with brass, you know it's pretty soft material. Uh, it peens really nicely. The only real risk here is that you take it too far and maybe wind up splitting the wood. But as long as you're reasonably careful about this, you don't overdo it, you should be able to get a good tight fit up without any real risk to the handle. So with that done, I just uh, put it back in the vise with a scrap of leather there to protect the blade and put the finishing touches on the handle with sandpaper. And I used a process that I've used before to darken wood and that's just to scorch the surface a little bit. You gotta be really, really careful doing this. I have overheated handles before and wound up ruining the, uh, the bond between the epoxy and the, and the handle and the blade. But if you're reasonably careful, uh, you can use the torch to bring out a little bit of darkness in the grain of the wood and you get that nice contrast in there. Uh, once I'm done with, the, with that light scorching, I like to go straight to the linseed oil. Uh, of course, the scorching process dries out the wood a little bit, so that wood is really ready to absorb the oil as soon as you put it on there. I'll usually do two coats, especially on the handle, and I've found that that gives a really good natural looking finish. You know, it's definitely not a glossy finish, it's a matte finish, but you get just a little bit of that yellow from the linseed oil, and, uh, and I think that adds a really nice kind of warmth and a really natural looking finish. So the knife is done. You can see the original design uh, laid out next to the finished knife. The only real significant difference is the hilt and the handle of the knife, and that was just something that I wanted to do. But overall, I'm really pleased with the way it worked out. There's probably always room for improvement, but overall, I'm really satisfied with the way it turned out. You know, not bad for my first shot at a hidden tang knife. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Again, right here at the end, uh, I'll actually have a little bit of footage here of cutting some paper to test out that edge. Um, and then there should actually be an end screen with, uh, with a link directly to Pyrotech 1999's video. Uh, I really think you should check that out. I have gotten a little sneak peek, a preview of it. I think you're really, really going to like it. He did an absolutely stunning job on that blade. So go and check out his video. If you haven't subbed to my channel and you like what you see, absolutely do so. I would love to have you as a part of the community. Click that bell so you get notifications, and don't forget to go and check out Pyrotech 1999. You're going to love his channel. I think you're especially going to love this video.